Shall we stand and pray? In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mother of the Savior, pray, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. This conference is on the problem of self. Because unfortunately with most people, the self is what gets between us and God. And it all really began with Adam and Eve. Well, no, this backed up. It actually began with Satan. Satan said that uh, I will not serve. In other words, he's going to choose what he wants, what he thinks over what God had revealed to him was actually going to be the case. So he says, I will not serve. So he places himself before God. And then, of course, Adam and Eve come and they are tempted. Eve eats the apple under the guise of one that was appealing, but also that there were, they would become like gods. So there was putting of self before God. And then, of course, after that, that becomes the example for all subsequent sin. Every time you commit a sin, you choose yourself over the law of God or God's glory. And so the self kind of gets in the way. In the er, This is something that's always plagued man, and it always will. But it's also one of the reasons why today God has allowed it to come to be the heresy. In other words, the thing that's really coming to the fore. In fact, Christ was, of course, the, the, the person who undid it all in the sense of uh, when he was at um, Mount Olives, when he was suffering, he said, not my will, but thine be done. So in other words, it wasn't his will. In other words, it wasn't what he wanted, but it was what God wanted, which undid everything um, that all the sin, which was based upon self. In the modern period, however, there began a period where this began, this putting self before everything or making self the principle of judgment. That is, what does that mean? What means any time you deal with anything, it's how do I feel? How did, what did I get out of it? What was my experience with it? If it was good, then it's okay. If it's not, then it's bad. That making the self the principle of judgment began with Descartes. Descartes said, uh, I don't know reality at all. So he cuts himself off from reality because we're not certain about this because our senses are deceiving us. And so the only thing I really know first and foremost is myself. And then from that he tries to reason other things, which of course it fails, and then Kant comes along and points out how it fails, but Kant still accepts the idea of Descartes that we're just cut off from reality, we can't really know it. And so in that process, intellectually in modern philosophy, which then begins to affect modern religion, it begins to affect modern political systems and that type of thing, it, it spreads and gets into everything. And so that the principle, the principle, the the primary thing that everybody now today judges everything in light of is self. And they call this the principle of imminence. Imminence comes from the Latin word in and monere, two Latin words, in and monere, to remain in. So that a person only judges something, all things in fact, uh, in light of how they get anything out of it or how they experience it. You see this like for example, uh, in its most uh, dramatic or uh, overt form, even though even traditionalists, we'll see this a little bit later, even traditionalists are some of the worst. But you see this, for example, in the charismatic renewal, where there's kind of a spiritual gluttony, where people are going around, they're doing things because they get some spiritual cookie out of it, and if it involves suffering, they shy away from it. But you'll see, you see that. Blondell said that even the transcendent, even the things of God, have no meaning for us unless we have some experience of them. In other words, even God, the Catholic faith, has to become subject to us and our judgment. And this is where modern, this, is, this was the culmination of centuries of bad philosophy, and it came to roost. And then, of <coughs> course, that meant that it became the foundation for modernism. Why modernism is the synthesis of all heresies. Well, if you make the person the self, that is the self, the, the thing upon which you judge everything else, well, of course you're going to get every conceivable kind of heresy based upon the fact that everybody has different dispositions, so everybody's going to be inclined to different things, and which means they're not going to conform themselves to what God reveals, but to what they want, and so every heresy is possible. Modern philosophy codified this selfishness and solipsism, that is just navel-gazing, look looking at self, as the way we think about everything, and this has become a serious problem 
for the church, and of course it's the intellectual foundation for the whole modernist heresy, which the church is just plagued with right now. And so, what's this mean? In a, in, above and beyond the fact that we suffer from original and actual sin, which makes us selfish and makes us concerned about ourselves and judge everything in light of ourselves, we have above and beyond that this whole external apparatus in the church, in culture, um, that feeds that and makes it the uh, makes it the principle. So that if we try and go against it, it's hard for people to stop thinking of everything in light of themselves. So how do we detect it for modernists? Or we can say more easily to understand how do we uh, how do we how do we detect um, if we're imitists, if we're selfish? That is self love. That's the question. How do we detect that? Well, among traditionalists, one of the things I've noticed is that you can ask some basic questions. Do we believe the things that pertain to the Catholic faith should be subject to our judgment? That's a question that we can ask. You know, if the Pope comes out and makes a statement, do we think, do we immediately assume the position, well, I'll believe it once I get a chance to take a look at it and see whether it's up to par or not? For example, if a, in other ways, if a traditionalist insists that the old Mass and surroundings of the old Mass are done in a, in a particular way, here we're not talking about following the rubrics. Obviously, we should all desire to follow the rubrics because in that way the priest sacrifices himself, and there's a certain merit in that, and that's what we actually want. And we also want to give God his due by right worship, and that's why we follow the rubrics. But sometimes people outside of the rubrics, there are certain things which the church left to custom or left to particular locations with the judgment of the priest, like, for instance, when the servers do specific things and that type of thing. And what's happened now is, is that traditionalists want it to be a specific way and so when you go to Mass, if they don't do it exactly the way you think it should be done, now we're, again, we're not talking about the rubrics, but we're talking about other things. It's a sign that it's, you know, if you're subjecting your experience at Mass, it's a sign that you're an imitist. Some of this actually comes from the fact that people are in the new right where everybody does everything they, they want and somehow or another God seems to be left out. I think that uh, the kiss of peace where the priest just walks off and everybody's walking and mingling around and there's God sitting all alone, I think is pretty much the manifestation of the immanentism, you know, we're all into ourselves and nobody seems to be into God. But people bring those experiences from there where everyone's doing their own thing to the old right, and so they want to impose on it a, a rigidity which, um, outside again, we have to be rigid about ex executing the rubrics. But when you're talking about things that aren't part of the rubrics or which are open to different customs in different locations, people become very critical and very thing without basing it on, print, on authentic Catholic principle. Sometimes this comes in the form of, I have, never, I have never heard of it, so it must be novel and therefore modernist and heretical. So that's actually happened. For instance, a lot of people have never heard of ordinary magisterial teaching. And so they just, so when you make that distinction, they say, that's just a novel distinction. Where did they come up with that kind of specious distinction? Well, it's right in church documents. You know, so in other words, you get this problem where I've never heard of it. When I was a kid, that's not what we did. Well, first of all, how do you know your memory's even accurate? Second of all, because you get that. People say, well, when we grew up, we always said the Our Father with the priest in the vernacular. Uh, no, that was in 65, not in 62. No, 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 it was in 62. Okay, you know, you just... Uh, but the point is, is that people want to force onto the right. They want to force onto these things based upon their experience or what they want. I recently wrote a prayer for uh, a petition for a miracle for the canonization of the cause of Mary Duvall. And uh, I, I tell you what, I, it, made, it purified me of any desire to get in any discussions about the, what should be done in the liturgy. The minute I put that prayer out, literally everybody wrote back, oh, you should have put this in, you should have done that, you should have done this, you should have done that. I'm just like, no, people today are just incapable of accepting something and just conforming themselves to it because they want the thing to conform to them, not the other way around. How many traditionalists come to the parish to pass and pass judgment on the priest based on what they want and not upon what God wants? You can ask yourself the basic question, how often have you judged a priest? If so, if you've judged him, you set yourself and what you think is the standard and thereby usurp the place of God. In fact, St. Thomas says this form of judgment is called the sin of usurpation. How often do you judge other people? How many traditions have gone to independent chapels or schismatic worship because they think suffering too much, they think they just cannot suffer the problems in the church anymore? Now, don't get me wrong, I, the fact that they're suffering is not, it's unjust, I, I admit that. But people are willing to do things, they're willing to go to a place just because of the fact that they, give, they do the worship that they like as the 
Holy Office said in the 1800s, even if the ritual of a schismatic group is the same as the one in which you are in your particular right, and even if there's nothing heretical or even if there's nothing immoral in it, just to join your prayer to schismatics, just to go there, is mortally sinful, which most people just don't seem to get. In other words, the traditions have become just as bad as everybody else. They want this particular kind of worship, and if they're not going to get it here, then they're willing to go to somebody who does it illicitly. They don't care as long as they get what they want. Um, this is basically saying to God that you want that you will determine what pleases you in worship and not, and not what pleases him. Immanentism or making the self the principal judgment destroys unity, since we cannot agree on an exterior object that is the faith or the expression of the faith, which is worship, but are only seeking our individual self-gratification, which means that it's divided into each individual person. So that in point in fact, immanentism destroys the order of charity, destroys charity. Modernism has destroyed charity because it's placed ourselves at the root of it. What's charity? Love of God and love of neighbor for the sake of God. Well, I don't see self anywhere in, in the definition of for the sake of God part. And so the motivation always has to be about God. We have to love ourselves, but for the sake of God. And what's happening is people have inverted that. You know, God's supposed to love me for my own sake. God loves me the way I am. You know, in other words, God has to conform his love to me rather than me conforming myself to the love of God. In the moral life, we see that once self becomes the principle, there's absolutely nothing that can keep people from ultimately trying out every form of evil. Because they'll think, oh, I can get some kind of pleasure out of that. So if you make yourself principle of judgment, every particular kind of sin is, is going to... So you see this in a period of immanentism or a period of selfishness. One person has a particular problem with one sin because it fits his disposition. Another person has a particular problem with a particular sin, and then he'll look down on this other guy for having that particular problem because he doesn't have it. But he has this other problem, which he doesn't seem to see as too much of an issue. The fact that people contracept or don't go to Mass or things like this is a sign of self being the principle. In the spiritual life, Father Croiset says, on his book on the Sacred Heart, as soon as a person begins to live in tepidity, spiritual lukewarmness, he seeks himself in everything. He continually looks for what will give pleasure. He surpasses the sensual in seeking his comforts and his self-love, not being weakened by being bestowed on exterior objects, concentrates itself on himself, applies itself entirely to thinking out a nice, comfortable life. It is easy to see that a soul in this state insensible to the most terrible truths of salvation, like hell, and still more insensible to most striking proofs of the love which Jesus Christ has for us is too far from the dispositions necessary for the devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus Christ to draw any fruit from it. In other words, a person comes so rooted in self that it's almost impossible for them to love Christ because of the fact that they're just caught up on their self. But on the other hand, the sacred, a devotion to the sacred heart is one of the principal means of overcoming self. In, a, in one sense, tepidity or lukewarmness is the cause of self-love. In other words, when people are just, they just don't care spiritually, then the effect of that is they're just going to go around doing whatever gratifies them. But in another sense, self-love, that is, you want your own comfort, you want only what's good coming to you, you don't want any pain or suffering, is the cause of spiritual lukewarmness. Parente, in his book on spiritual direction, observes that as long as a person is self-conscious, that is, when you're in a group of people, or when you're like at Mass, or whenever they say you're thinking about yourself, or aware of yourself, or anytime you do any spiritual good, you're thinking about yourself, he says that person will suffer mediocrity in the spiritual life. So, why? Because... You know, one of the things that really disturbed me about the book by Jacques Maritain called Integral Humanism, well, okay, the whole book is disturbing, but one of the things, he lays out the whole root of the problem. He says, the problem with the medieval understanding of the spiritual life is that it was so focused on God out of a metaphysical modesty that it failed to look at itself. And so the rest of his book is really about us looking at ourselves, so it's really about applying the immanentist principle to you know basically every facet of philosophy. But the point is is that 
it destroy what most spiritual writers today do not understand is that the only reason you pay any attention to yourself is because you want to root out problems. In other words, you're looking for what's bad. But in order to become perfect, you have to root out what's bad in you, but your focus has to become entirely God so that you root out these bad things for the sake of God. Not because you're displeased with yourself, which is again making yourself the principle of judgment because you've got this problem. Not because you don't want other people thinking about it because again that puts yourself in the middle of it. In other words, you do this because you love God and you don't want to offend Him. In other words, it's a kind of fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord, St. Thomas defines as turning away from created goods and turning towards God. You cannot have any fear of the Lord if you, who is a created good, are constantly looking at yourself. You have to be able to turn away from yourself and turn to God in order to have wisdom. What's the definition of wisdom? St. Thomas defines it as the, the consideration of the ultimate causes of things. What does that mean? Well, it means... It's ultimately the consideration of God and the things of God. You can't consider God until you get yourself out of the picture and look at God. And that means you have to turn away from created things and turn to God. So what's this mean? Ultimately, it means that as long as you are in the middle of, the thing, of, middle of things, you will always be spiritually mediocre at best. In this respect, if we are mediocre in the spiritual life, we know that we suffer from self-love. So if I'm just not doing very well in spiritual life and I'm doing well, well, okay, you've got some type of self-love somewhere. No man who puts himself at the head of things or puts himself aside, sorry, no man who puts himself aside and burns with zeal for um, God will remain mediocre for long. It's just, it's just not going to happen. Eventually he'll just get sick of looking at himself. One of the things about prayer is, is that if you're praying and you're contemplating the things that pertain to God, like in mental prayer, praying, you're contemplating God's goodness, His providence for you, the things that He's, um, you know, the fact that He's all just and all merciful and all that, and you can contemplate these things. Eventually, you get sick of yourself because you're just not as interesting as God. But unfortunately, most people, it's the other way around. Father Croiset observes, those of self-love pursue only virtues which fit their disposition or taste. In other words, they'll advance in certain areas of the spiritual life because they like this and it fits them and they get some pleasure out of it. But the one that causes pain and suffering, they avoid that like the plague. Those who do not suffer from self-love are very rare, he says. Self-love deceives us in thinking our spiritual life is actually better than it is. If you don't think you're that bad, it is more likely that you suffer from self-love. The saints always thought they were the worst. And why is that? Because they begin to realize as time goes on that without God's grace and without God being involved in the process, their trajectory is just to something evil. That's just the, the nature of it. And even if they gain a lot of virtue, they just know that without God's grace to enact the virtue, they're just going to end up doing something stupid. So what happens is, is that they get to the point where they just can't stand themselves, and yet they love God completely. One of the reasons why we tend to think our spiritual life is better than it is, is that St. Thomas says that whenever we consider ourselves, part of a natural inclination in us is to recognize ourselves as something good. And so when people think about themselves, they easily get intoxicated with this goodness. Look how good I am. Look at how wonderful I am. Aren't I? Just look at how good this is, you know. It's in me, you know, that type of thing. And so it ends up blinding them to the reality of how bad they really are. And then what happens is the person will do something like, I couldn't believe I did that. Well, I can. So it doesn't surprise me in the slightest. Mortification. This is why people come to me to confess. I, you know, I really feel bad, but I don't. I, you know, I really feel embarrassed to confess this, or I really feel like, you know, I, I can't confess this because if I do, I, you'll just think badly of me. But the point is, is that people are, there. It's it's a problem of human respect, which we'll see later. Mortifications are often considered indiscreet or ill-advised. You know, it's not a good idea to be doing that. Self-love destroys the motivation to take sorrow in the mortification. Why? Because when you love yourself, St. Thomas defines love as willing the good of another. In our case, when we love ourselves, we will ourselves good. The problem is, because of original sin, we tend to will ourselves created goods rather than the spiritual goods or God or whatever the case is. We don't will ourselves that, we will ourselves the created goods. And so, because we will ourselves created goods, we don't want to be mortified. That is, we don't want to deprive ourselves of these created goods. The inspiration from God by grace to mortification or to purification, advancement, holiness, are at variance with these kinds of people's will.
In other words, because of their attachment to self, which becomes the principle of judgment of what they do, they simply are unwilling to do the penance necessary to atone for their sins and purify their souls. These people, if they manage to save their soul, we spend you know, long, large amounts of time in purgatory because they've never made up for anything. They are overly worried about their health while making excuses that it helps them to be better spiritually. Oh, well, you know, I, I, I spend five hours a day working out because that way I can concentrate for 15 minutes praying. Okay. We delude ourselves. I'm saying you should take reasonable care of your health, which means that it's limited. And it has to be, St. Thomas says, the goods of the body are ordered for the goods of the soul. So the reason you take care of your body is for the sake of the soul, not the other way around. And sometimes people who are guilty of self-love or guilty of just... Uh, uh, of immanentism, they really, they'll, they'll spend enormous amounts of time in this and think that they're actually doing something good spiritually. We delude ourselves into thinking that God does not demand great sanctity of us. I mentioned last night, God had intended for you to reach a certain level. Well, guess what? You're not going to reach it because you haven't done what you should have. Now, there's a way to get back up there, by the way. It's called supererogation. You do prayers that are above and beyond. So now you can make up through prayers that are not required of you, because there are certain prayers required out of justice. We have to pray every day out of justice. But if you pray above and beyond that, or if you do penance above and beyond that, then it'll actually, you can get back up to that place. But most people aren't willing to do that. And people think, well, God doesn't want great things. You know, I, I was never intended to be a Padre Pio. Uh, quite the contrary. Now, true, if, you know, you can't suffer from spiritual envy. Like, I want the place of our Blessed Mother. You know, well, okay, obviously we got a problem. But on the other hand, we have to do what St. Paul says, one run to win the prize. You have to strive to gain the highest place you possibly can, because that's what God wants for you. And so those people who think that, they don't, that God doesn't intend a high place for them tend to neglect the spiritual life. I don't have to worry about it. God doesn't want me that high, so I don't have to worry. Sometimes it is the opposite. The person thinks that he will have one of the higher places in heaven, but of course he's doing absolutely nothing to merit it. I'm so wonderful. I deserve a place right underneath the Blessed Virgin, or at least at least near St. Joseph. We think something cannot possibly be the will of God when it goes contrary to our self-love. God wouldn't want me doing this. I'm miserable when I do this. You know, I'm miserable when I fast. Obviously, God doesn't want this. When they do advance, they want the advancement in holiness to be filled with consolations and sweetness. They're spiritual gluttons. The only time they'll do anything is if they're going to get some type of spiritual cookie out of it. We imagine ourselves, and so they always judge, I'm advancing because I'm, doing, I'm getting this cookie. If they're not getting the cookie, there must be something wrong. And that's a sign of self-love. We imagine ourselves to have very few faults, which are judged easily overcome if we want to. In other words, oh, I could easily come over that if I wanted to, because it's filled with pride, of course. Our conduct is often determined by how we feel rather than the will of God. The person who makes self the principle of judgment is miserably miserable interiorly because he desi his desires are never satisfied by his life or by others. In other words, he's just not satisfied with what God has given him in life. I've seen mar many married women hate their husbands because they did not get out of marriage what they wanted. And I'm talking long term. You know, when they first get married, he thinks, boy, she's such a sweet little thing. Then 25 years later, man, what happened? She just hates my guts. All right. <laughs> Well, some of it's because she has to be detached. Uh, to, in order, you know, of course, he's got to do his part. There's other defects that males suffer from. But um, with women, very often, they, they don't get what they want, so they become very difficult for their husband, and that's a sign they don't have detachment. And this, of course, obviously applies to men. Sometimes men don't get what they want out of marriage, and so they, they make their wife pay for it. The divorce culture is a sign of the reign of immunitism. I didn't get what I wanted out of marriage, therefore I'm out of here. So one of the things that people fail to realize is that when you take your wedding vows, a vow is an act of religion rendered before God. And so the reason you remain married, even if it's nightmarish, is because it's an act of religion. You're and that's, of course, you're talking about grave harming coming to you or your kids or whatever the case is. But you have to stick with it because you made a vow before God. So even if your married life is miserable, if you're rendering your vow before God, there's merit in that. Their emotional life is virtually uncontrollable because, as St. Thomas says, love is the beginning of all passion. So if I love something, somebody injures it, I suffer sorrow from it, I get depressed, or I have the initial sorrow, but then I want to harm this other person to quit harming me, 
And so I get angry with them. That's what St. Thomas says the definition of anger is. He says, it's the presence of evil which causes sorrow, and then there from that arises a desire for vindication. So I become very angry. So what's this mean? If they're la- attached to self, if you're really an angry type of individual, you have to step back and say, I obviously love myself too much. Because if you don't love yourself and you're only really interested in God, you know, the saints are the type, they can just take, people can just be slapping them around and they're just content as the day is long. It doesn't matter to them. Uh, not, I'm not saying that they're not concerned about the fact that this guy's committing sin, but they're just, they're, their cells are completely on the background. It doesn't disturb them interiorly. They often complain that they, they would be holy if others did not provide the occasion of their faults. I mentioned last night with the nun in the monastery, but you also see this with road rage. You know, I would be a much more courteous driver if it wasn't for all these other idiots on the road. Right. It destroys the order of charity, as I mentioned. Charity, again, is love of God and love of neighbor for the sake of God. So, and love of self, or love yourself as your neighbor, but that's for the sake of God. And so it's ultimately about God. What immanentism does is it inverts the process where self becomes at the center and God gets out on the, on the outside. And so it destroys the order of charity. It contradicts the very foundation of charity, which is God, who is the center of the universe, not us. Our Lord predicted about this about the end times in Matthew 24, 12. He says, And because iniquity hath abounded, the charity of many shall grow cold. So in other words, once people start making themselves the principle of judgment, in the end times, God will retract his grace, people become selfish, and it will destroy charity. And you see that. The, again, the principle of imminence is the root of modernism, and that's why it's destroyed charity in the church. Those who make themselves the principle of judgment get mopped up by the demonic, who make constant use of their attachments to self in order to lay waste to their advancement in the spiritual life and ultimately even to lead them to ruin. Our life of devotion, very often for those who are imminentists or who only think of themselves, is based upon self. You know, why does Father do the stations? Why can't we do this? You know, you get that kind of a thing. Our prayer life is determined by how we feel, or the ease of the prayers, or the form of the prayer based upon our natural inclination. Every time I say this prayer, I just feel so good. All right. They sacrifice nothing, especially themselves. They greedily hold on to their time, especially if it is used to gratify themselves. So you'll get this, some guy's flipping through the channels, you know, and the wife comes up, and of course, he, first of all, he doesn't even hear her until finally the, the noise gets so loud he can't hear the TV and he realizes there's some dissonance, what's going on? And he starts looking around, oh, there's my wife. Uh, but then he gets irritated because she's cutting into the football game, you know. All right, so they don't want to be say, hold on to their time, you know. I want, I, I'd like two hours in the morning just for myself, thank you. Um, I have a relative one time who was told by the psychologist that you need to sit down every day and let your wife talk to you, talk at you, basically, for an hour each day. So there he sat for an hour each day. And it, of course, it didn't solve any of her problems whatsoever. All right. This is what you get. People want time for them. They want it's, The time has to be about them. And the imitators are selfish and are unwilling to put away the things that, even if more illicit, is impeding their advance in virtue and holiness. They suffer impatience. I'm not getting what I want. Lack of long suffering. Why do I have to suffer this long? They suffer from pride, thinking themselves better than they are because they're intoxicated with the good of, fe- of the feeling that comes from thinking about themselves. They like, and they're, they're, their pride is easily hurt. If you do not take humiliations well, or if there's any pain whatsoever in any humiliation, it's a sign that you have a problem with self-will and pride. They like people who like them. So, in other words, you know, so-and-so is a really good man. Well, why do you say that? Well, because he's nice to me. Well, what about so-and-so? He seems to be a nice man. No, he's always telling me I should quit cussing. I don't like him. He's not a good man, you know, that type of thing. The saints often preferred the people who hated them. They'd follow them around because they'd get abuse from them. Like, oh, I like that. I'm not suggesting you do that, but because you have to be at a certain stage spiritually. 
but uh, that what, how, whether you could judge people are good or bad should, and whether you like them or not should not be based on whether they're feeding your appetites. And they often hate people who are selfish. Well, I hate that person because they're selfish. Why? Because he's not thinking about me. It's usually the, the line. They wallow in servile fear rather than chaste fear because their fear is ultimately about themselves, not whether they're offending God. Gerlugu Lagrange says in the three stages of the interior life, self-will thus defined is the source of every sin. For this reason, St. Bernard says, take away self-will and there will be no longer any, be any hell. In other words, hell is the place of self-will. Self-will is particularly dangerous because it can corrupt everything, even what is best in man, because evil when self-will enters in for it takes itself as its end instead of the subordinating itself to God. And this is why I keep telling everybody, two things are required to get the liturgical situation straightened out, the situation straightened out of the church. One, you have to have knowledge. This business of people, if we're just holy, it'll be okay. No, look, I'm sorry, but we've dug ourselves so deep into a pit. We need a bit of knowledge about how to use this climbing equipment. Thank you. But you have to have the will to climb out of the hole, and that requires holiness. And so we have to have those two things. Otherwise, we're just not going to get out of this problem. Because we ha we've, we've dug ourselves into this pit called self-love and self, and now we're trying to get back out of it because God's standing at the top. And that means we have to turn away from ourselves. It requires a certain degree of denial. Gerlugu Grange goes on to say, If the Lord sees that it inspires a fast, a penance, a sacrifice, he rejects them as pharisaical works accomplished through pride in order to make one's self esteemed. In other words, if God sees that you just do this because you're doing it for yourself, you aren't doing any merit for it. Without going that far, we must admit that we that we cling greatly to our own will. Occasionally, we hold to our way of doing good more than to the good itself. We wish to we wish it to be done, but by ourselves and in our way. When this egoism becomes collective, it may be called an esprit de corps, so the spirit of a group a corruption of family spirit. It is the source of the great many unpleasantnesses, partialities, and defamations. This is why when I went to St. Francis, the first homily I gave when we got the church is, I said, okay, the priest can do absolutely everything, but if basically, to give you the upshot of the homily, if you're going to be imitatists, it's not going to do any good, regardless of how holy the priest is. Because what happens? When people are only concerned about themselves, they come into a place, they don't get what they want, so they start fomenting problems. Sometimes a certain group wishes to promote a good work, or it hinders one from being developed. So you see this, the guy who's really concerned about himself, he's not capable of taking somebody who's really good at something and putting him in charge of it, because he knows, well, if I put him in charge, that'll make me not look as good, so I'm going to keep him from getting that job. It is like wishing to smother a child who seems to be one too many, when as a matter of fact it may become the honor of the family. Evidently, such a course of action can only, be displeased, can only displease the Lord. So how do we overcome this self? First is sincere humility. You have to admit your defects and you have to come to knowledge of yourself Part of which is recognizing that you are not the center of attention. You have to get out of the habit of just thinking of yourself. You have to ask the Holy Ghost and your guardian angel to reveal your defects, not just once, but periodically. And you have to be willing to do it for a while. I always tell people, take a week to two weeks, do that, and they'll let you know. But you have to be willing to suffer if you're going to get this truth. In other words, you have to be prepared to be depressed. A lot of times people say, oh, I can't believe how bad I am. You know? You know you have a problem with self-love if someone tells you to do something which you do not like and it causes your interior pain, uh, sorrow, or aversion. So what do you do to overcome that? You do what you don't want to do. If it's a, it's a morally good thing or if it's good for other people, you do it, even if it causes you pain or difficulty. Avoid notional assent to this, but give real assent. And that's when I mentioned real assent is when you, you know it's true and you do it. So you have to be willing to, yeah, I should do penance, or I should do this, or yeah, I should really work on, yeah, I'm proud, but you don't really think you are, because you, you're, you're not really dealing with it. Mortification, mortification, mortification. You have to beg God for the spirit of mortification and self-denial. You just have to. 
the problem is is that people just they'll do certain things they'll get to the point where their prayer life is okay and they're like i can't want to can't understand why i'm not advancing this in the in my prayer life well it's because you're not mortifying yourself you have to kill this self-love if you're going to advance you have to you should make acts of charity now, this comes in two forms. You can just do it directly, God, I love you, you know, and say those throughout the course of the day. But you can also um, make, there's the acts of charity in those older manuals, which are really good, to say those frequently. Seeking to love God alone, you must seek to love God alone, even when love of self, even when you love yourself. In other words, you should only be thinking, okay, what's best for me? Uh, when you're thinking about yourself, okay, what's best for me? You should really be thinking, how is God going to get the most glory out of me? That's what should be your concern, not, you know, how many chocolate eclairs am I going to get in the next week? You know? <laughs> it must be for the love of God with no deference to our own good, but to God's good alone. Now, part of God's good is to receive glory by our own good, and so we seek that, but it has to be purified. You have to purify our intentions, our motivations. Are you doing this because spiritually you want to feel good about yourself, or are you doing it because you want to do it because you love God? You should develop a strong devotion to the Sacred Heart and to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. The Sacred Heart, obviously, because the Sacred Heart overcomes spiritual tepidity and helps us burn with charity. The Immaculate Heart, if for no other reason than by example, because of the fact that through her willingness to do to suffer the seven sorrows and to go through the suffering and to do what's necessary, she showed perfect selflessness. The fact that she just even accepted our Lord, uh, to be the mother of our Lord, was a sign of selflessness. And so we need to use her as an example, pray to her often to help us to overcome ourselves. Do not expect quick fixes. You know, people who are really concerned about themselves spiritually, okay, I'll go to so-and-so, the father so-and-so, and I'll ask his advice. And he says, okay, you got to do mortification. Well, I didn't like that. I was hoping he would just kind of, you know, um, maybe say some prayer for me and then I'd be done with this. Well, and so then he, you know, or he would say, um, you know, well, I'll just pray for you and then that'll be the end of it. No, it doesn't do, it doesn't work that way. You can't expect a quick fix. And you uh, and they want to apply them in, in your life. You have to apply, you have to apply consistent mortification and prayer throughout the, for consistently and perseveringly for the remaining of your life. That's how you're going to overcome yourself. Obedience to the church. To grace, that comes in the form of fidelity to grace, and to a spiritual director. In other words, if, if you're at a certain stage in your spiritual life, some people come to me, would you be my spiritual director? If I don't know the person, I'll usually ask them, well, are you, staying, are you habitually staying out of venial sin? No. What's your prayer life like? Are you praying consistently? Are you praying at least 15 minutes of meditation a day? No. So then I start going down the list. And then what I'll do is say, you accomplish this first. And then I'll be your spiritual director. Some people I know, they've already been under a spiritual director, and they've already advanced to a certain degree, and so I might take them. Or some people I know that are, are serious about the spiritual life. But as I tell the seminarians, you have to be careful, because there's always an imitatist that wants you to listen to them about their interior life. In other words, they just want an ear. My husband won't listen to me, so I wanted you to be my spiritual director. Okay. So you have to be really careful. Or they just want their ears tickled. Father says such wonderful things. I just like listening to him. And you, you see this. People will come to you and you'll just say, this is what you have to do. Well, it didn't tickle their ears, so they're kind of depressed. I mean, he's not a very good director, I guess. You know, they get that kind of thing. You have to be willing to be obedient to your superior. In this respect, women have a, gr have a greater ease in advancing in holiness by having a head in their, uh, in their husband. Whereas men, it's much more complicated because it ha they're... they're who they look to be their superiors a little bit more subtle. Whereas women just say, do you do this? If you want this done, as long as it's not immoral, of course, then that's what I'll do. And then you just do it. And then there's a certain liberation from it. In other words, ourselves are burdensome. We're messed up. We're disordered. Well, you know, if you, if you had something that every time you held it, it was burning your hands, you know, and, and somebody kept throwing it at you, and you're just like, what am I going to get rid of this thing? When you finally get rid of it, you're just like, oh, that's a burden off my, you know, and I don't have to deal with my hands getting burned. The problem is, that's the way ourselves are. Until you get rid of yourself, your spiritual life is going to be burdensome, difficult. Your interior life is going to be burdensome, and your life is just going to be burdensome generally. So what's the conclusion? 
Hell is the place of immanentists, because no one there thinks of God. Uh, they don't want to, except negatively. In other words, they think of him negatively as, look what his justice did to me, that type of thing. And they only think of their own suffering, that is, themselves. This is why as the world um, becomes more selfish, it is becoming more disordered and is beginning to take on, the, it starts, it's starting to look more and more like hell. And people are taking on the characteristics of demons. You're starting to see this. People are, it's just, stuff is just getting more and more demonic. In heaven, not a single solitary person is an animatist, save God alone. And it's his place to be an animatist because he's all good. You're not. So it's okay for God to say, look how good I am. It's not your place to do that. That's why it says in the New Testament, it's not the man who commends himself but the one who God commends is the one that's worthy. If you want to join the ranks of the saints, you must stop thinking about yourself and start thinking about God alone in every aspect of your life, and not just where it is comfortable. All right. If you'll kneel, I'll give you a blessing. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, et Supervos et Semper. Amen.